But it is really sad that lies and personal attacks are basically the only thing that the Biden campaign has left to run on. Well, that and the fact that they also have a person with lady parts and black skin on the ticket. Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. There's no way to go over all of it. They spoke for, what, an hour and a half? There'd be absolutely no way for me to go over all of this. So what I'm going to do is, since I don't have time to parse through every single lie that Kamala Harris said, or at the very least something completely misleading, we're going to go over tonight the top five Kamala Harris lies. Number five. So the first big lie that Kamala Harris utters is going to be about taxation and spending. On the other hand, you have Donald Trump, who measures the strength of the economy based on how rich people are doing, which is why he passed a tax bill benefiting the top 1% and the biggest corporations of America, leading to a $2 trillion deficit that the American people are going to have to pay for. On day one, Joe Biden will repeal that tax bill. He'll get rid of it. And what he'll do with the money is invest it in the American people. That's how Joe Biden thinks about the economy, which is it's about investing in the people of our country as opposed to passing a tax bill, which had the benefit of letting American corporations go offshore to do their business. So there's a lot to dig through in this particular lie. First of all, one of the things that she says that is completely misleading is she said that, well, these tax cuts benefit the rich more. Okay, well, they technically do, but it was an across-the-board tax cut. See, the way that she phrases her response there is she makes it sound like these were tax cuts for the rich, but it's simply not true. It was an across-the-board tax cut. Did wealthy people see a larger tax cut than people that were not so wealthy? Yeah, they did, but that's because they were paying more to begin with. So yes, there is a larger benefit in theory based on the way that you look at it when it came to Donald Trump's tax cuts because it amounted in what was virtually, not exactly, but pretty close to a 2% tax cut across the board. So yeah, rich people saw a little bit more of that money, but everybody got virtually the same percentage of their tax burden cut. And another thing too, it's hilarious that she, at the end of that, crows about the deficit, how bad it is, that it's unconscionable that Donald Trump would allow there to be a $2 trillion deficit. Oh, the woe and lamentation over that. When it comes to spending, Senator Harris votes in favor of virtually every spending measure that shows up in front of the Senate. And so it's kind of weird for her, a sitting senator who votes for all the spending measures to complain about how bad the deficit is. When Senator Harris was a candidate for president herself, that her spending bill would have been $4.162 trillion in new spending per year. She is the only Democrat candidate whose spending measures were larger than Bernie Sanders. Think about that. Bernie Sanders, an avowed socialist, was second in that race when it came to spending proposals. Kamala Harris outpaced him. That's astounding. And she's the one that wants to talk about how bad deficits are? Really? Furthermore, let's actually look at the Biden plan. So you can see here, this is from the Tax Foundation. Biden's plan would raise tax revenue by $3.05 trillion over the next decade on a conventional basis. When accounting for macroeconomics feedback effects, so in other words, what they're talking about there is the side effects that would have by increasing the tax burden, people trying to evade taxes, people moving overseas, that kind of thing, the plan would collect about $2.65 trillion in the next decade. This is lower than we originally estimated due to the revenue effects of the coronavirus pandemic and the economic downturn and new tax credit proposals introduced by the Biden campaign. According to the Tax Foundation's general equilibrium model, the Biden tax plan would reduce GDP by 1.4% over the long term. 
On a conventional basis, the Biden tax plan by 2030 would lead to about 6.5% less after-tax income for the top 1% of taxpayers and about a 1.7% decline in after-tax income for all taxpayers on average. In other words, according to the Tax Foundation's research, not just rich people, not just the 1%, are going to see a reduction in the amount of money that they are taking home. So you are going to necessarily see under Biden's tax plan less of your own money. So these are the numbers under the Biden-Harris plan. It's going to cost $1.35 trillion in new spending. Now you subtract from that the $305 billion in new taxes, because remember, it was going to cost $3.05 billion in new taxes. That was how much was going to be collected over the next 10 years, so... Divide by 10, you get $305 billion in new taxes. So you subtract that from the cost in new spending, but then you add the $2 trillion that we currently have in the deficit, and you know what you're left with? $3.045 trillion in deficit. So right after Kamala Harris starts crowing about how horrible it is that there's all this deficit spending by President Trump, she is in the same breath talking about a plan and promoting a plan that would cause a 52% increase in deficit spending, even if you do factor in the new taxes that they are talking about loading and even if you completely ignore all of the macroeconomic side effects of that. Because keep in mind, we're ignoring what the Tax Foundation said about how much it would actually collect. Even if you ignore and say there, there would be no effect on the economy, no business people, no private citizens would adjust their behavior in any way as a result of the new tax plan, even if you ignore all of those factors and give them the best possible scenario, they're still running a deficit that is 52% larger than President Trump's deficit. Now, in that same clip, because there's a whole lot of lies to go over in that short little clip, Harris also claims that the Trump tax cuts actually sent jobs overseas. You don't have to take my word for it. Take the word of the Washington Post fact checker. Moreover, the law is believed to have broadly reduced incentives to invest overseas compared with the previous system. Even if it's possible a new loophole was created, many other loopholes were closed. Biden earns two Pinocchios, are equivalent of half true. The concerns he raises are worth paying attention to, but he cannot express them with such certainty. So there you have it, two Pinocchios. Even the Washington Post fact checker, which has been totally in the bag for President Biden, had to admit, yeah, this one wasn't true. Vice President Pence just absolutely destroyed Kamala Harris on this one. Check it out. President Trump cut taxes across the board. Despite what uh, Senator Harris says, the average American family of four had $2,000 in savings in taxes. And with the rise in wages that occurred, most predominantly for blue collar, hardworking Americans, the average household income for a family of four increased by $4,000 following President Trump's tax cuts. But America, you just heard Senator Harris tell you, on day one, Joe Biden's going to raise your taxes. Oh! Remarkable to think, Susan. That's not what I said. I mean, now you heard her deny it, but she just said it. She just said that they were going to roll back the Trump tax cuts, and Pence comes back with, "Well, that would raise people's taxes." And she goes, "That's not what I said." No, that's absolutely what you said. She's asking you to ignore what you just heard come out of her own mouth. Other people have fact checked this, including Newsweek. So this is Newsweek. Remember, not exactly a bastion of conservative thought. This is the same people that were saying that Amy Coney Barrett was a member of the cult that inspired The Handmaid's Tale and then had to print a retraction just a couple of weeks ago. So not exactly a right-leaning news publication. They said this about whether or not the tax cuts, taking away the Trump tax cuts, would raise taxes on regular people. That's why I'm going to eliminate the Trump tax cuts. I'm going to eliminate those tax cuts, Biden said as Trump responded. That's okay. The verdict? True. Pence's claim that Biden said he would bring an end to the Trump tax cuts are true. However, this claim that Biden is going to raise your taxes likely depends on your income level. Again, they're, they're trying to capitulate 
But if you remove those tax cuts, that would raise taxes on people. Number four. All right, number four, and one of the more obvious lies on this list, is Kamala Harris just talking about the environment. You know, what's remarkable is the United States has reduced CO2 more than the countries that are still in the Paris Climate Accord, but we've done it through innovation, and we've done it through natural gas and fracking, which, Senator, the American people can go look at the record. I, I know Joe Biden says otherwise now, as you do, but the both of you repeatedly committed to abolishing fossil fuel and banning of fracking. And so by creating the kind of American innovation, we're actually steering toward a stronger and better environment. And the American people know that Joe Biden will not ban fracking. That is a fact. That is a fact. And with regard to banning fracking, I just recommend that people look at the record. You yourself said repeatedly that you would ban fracking. You were the first Senate co-sponsor of the Green New Deal. And while Joe Biden denied the Green New Deal, Susan, thank you for pointing out the Green New Deal is on their campaign website. And as USA Today said, it's essentially the same plan as you co-sponsored with AOC when she submitted it in the Senate. Holy cow. Mike, Mike Pence is just fantastic at this. Dropping some truth bombs right on Kamala Harris's head. And the only response she has to say is, it's not true. It's a fact. It's a fact that that's not true. We're not going to ban fracking. Joe Biden is not going to ban frac fracking. It's a fact. Can't do anything to back it up. All Mike Pence is saying is, you don't have to take my word for it. Look at the record. So this is from the Biden campaign website. Biden believes the Green New Deal is a crucial framework for meeting the climate change challenges. You can just look at what they have said about this, what they have said about fracking, what they have said about the green energy and banning fossil fuels and the Green New Deal in their own words. Are you ready to commit to the responsible phase out of fossil fuel production as part of your yes. administration? Well, look, we gotta go to zero emissions, man. Zero emissions. Zero emissions. And, 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 and we can. It's within our wheelhouse. The and answer is yes. Would there be any place for fossil fuels, including coal and fracking, in a Biden administration? No. We would, be, we, would, we would work it out. We would make sure it's eliminated and no more subsidies for either one of those. Either any fossil fuel. We must have and adopt a Green New Deal. On day one as president, I would re-enter us in the Paris Thank Agreement. You. And I think it's critically important on day one that we end any fossil fuel leases on public lands. If they fail to act as president of the United States, I am prepared to get rid of the filibuster to pass a Green New Deal. We, we, are, we are going to get rid of fossil fuels. They, they want to do the same thing I want to do. They want to phase out fossil fuels, and we're going to phase out fossil fuels. That's why we have. That's why in our administration we wiped out no more, no more coal plants. I mean, that's pretty darn conclusive. You don't have to do a lot of guesswork to figure out what their position is on that. Kamala Harris going so far as to saying, "You know what? I will get rid of the filibuster if it means getting a green new deal. I don't care what I have to do. I don't care if it completely destroys tradition in the Senate." just completely going over the norms of how our government functions, I'm just going to, it's that important to me that I am okay with just completely eliminating the filibuster to get the Green New Deal. Number three. Number three, you probably saw this one coming. It's not because it's a lie that is new or something that surprised anyone. It's just because it gets used over and over again and they still refuse to accept the truth of it. It's Kamala Harris saying that Donald Trump has never denounced white supremacy, that he actually went out of his way to not denounce white supremacy. Where last week, the President of the United States took a debate stage in front of 70 million Americans and refused to condemn white supremacists. Not true. And not true. It wasn't like he didn't have a chance. He didn't do it, and then he doubled down. He, on the issue of Charlottesville, where people were peacefully protesting the need for racial justice, where a young woman was killed, and on the other side there were neo-Nazis carrying tiki torches, shouting racial epithets, anti-Semitic slurs, and Donald Trump, when asked about it, said there were fine people on both sides. Here is a Snopes transcript of the very debate 
that Kamala Harris is talking about, you can read the transcript with me. I, again, I'm not asking you to take my word for it. Just look at the facts. So here it is, Chris Wallace addressing Trump. You have repeatedly criticized the vice president for not calling out Antifa and other left-wing extremist groups. Trump, that's right. Wallace, but you are willing tonight to condemn white supremacists and militia groups. Trump, sure. In what universe is that not denouncing white supremacy? He says, are you willing to condemn white supremacists and militia groups? And Trump says, sure. And then Wallace said, and to say that they need to stand down and not add the violence in a number of these cities, as we saw in Kenosha and as we've seen in Portland. Sure, I'm willing to do that, but... And then Wallace goes on, the point in all of that is, and you could even argue that he said it a third time because he, he says something similar to that a third time after that. But the point in all of this is that Trump absolutely, at the very least twice, condemned white supremacy in the very debate that Kamala Harris is saying he refused to condemn white supremacy. That's simply not true. Let's look at the press event that Kamala Harris was talking about where Trump said that it was very fine people in Charlottesville, because all you have to do is add a little bit of context, about 30 seconds in either direction, and you will see him actually deny and denounce white supremacists in the very clip that Kamala Harris is talking about. And you had some very bad people in that group, but you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. So you know what? It's fine. You're changing history, you're changing culture, and you had people, and I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis and the white nationalists, because they should be condemned totally. But you had many people in that group other than neo-Nazis and white nationalists, okay? And the press has treated them absolutely unfairly. If you look, they were people protesting very quietly the taking down of the statue of Robert E. Lee. And by the way, that's not the only time that President Trump has condemned white supremacy. He has done this over and over and over and over again. How many times do I have to reject? I've rejected David Duke, rejected David Duke. Uh, I've rejected the uh, KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. Now, I have been asked this question so many times. I have rejected it so many times. How many times do I have to reject or disavow? Let me ask you this question. What about the, David Duke is saying to his supporters and followers, vote for Donald Trump. White supremacists are saying, vote. do you want those votes? No, I don't want them, and I don't want him to say it. What do you How think many of white times? supremacists, by the way? I don't like any group of hate. The hate groups are not for me. We condemn in the strongest possible terms this egregious display of hatred, bigotry, and violence, it has no place in America. We must love each other, show affection for each other, and unite together in condemnation of hatred, bigotry, and violence. We must rediscover the bonds of love and loyalty that bring us together as Americans. Racism is evil. And those who cause violence in its name are criminals and thugs, including the KKK, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and other hate groups that are repugnant to everything we hold dear as Americans. Anti-Semitism and the widespread persecution of Jews represents one of the ugliest and darkest features of human history. The vile, hate-filled poison of anti-Semitism must be condemned and confronted everywhere and anywhere it appears. There must be no tolerance for anti-Semitism in America or for any form of religious or racial hatred or prejudice. With one unified voice, we condemn the historic evil of anti-Semitism and every other form of evil. In one voice, our nation must condemn racism, bigotry, and white supremacy. These sinister ideologies must be defeated. Hate has no place in America. As you can see, he has condemned white supremacy and racism over and over and over and over and over again, as far back as 2016, before he was even the president. And he's done it again and again and again. And yet the media continues with this narrative like he's never done it before. Uh, you saw this actually when they questioned his press secretary 
a couple of days ago when they were asking, well, is he willing to condemn white supremacy? He's like, but he has. And she listed a, a big list of, and just rattled off a whole bunch of times when he's condemned white supremacy. He's like, but, but is he willing to do it now? Like, well, well, I just did it. Like, but, but are you doing it now? I mean, it's, it's one of the most ridiculous things. It's like, if Donald Trump doesn't spend every single moment of every single day, 24 hours a day, condemning white supremacy, then he hasn't condemned white supremacy. No, he's done it over and over and over and over again. Number two. And number two on this list is a long, long list of Harris just straight up lying about the economy and the state of it. When we look at where this administration has been, there are estimates that by the end of the term of this administration, they will have lost more jobs than almost any other presidential administration. Susan. And the American people know what I'm talking about. You know, I, I think about 20 year olds, you know, we have a 20 year old, a 20 something year old who are coming out of high school and college right now. And you're wondering, is there gonna be a job there for me? We're looking at people who are trying to figure out how they're gonna pay rent by the end of the month. Almost half of American renters are worried about whether they're going to be able to pay rent by the end of the month. This is where the economy is in America right now, and it is because of the catastrophe and the failure of leadership of this administration. First of all, it's blatantly unfair to attribute the losses because of coronavirus on President Trump. Second of all, what should he have done different? because it's real easy to Monday morning quarterback and sit back in your chair and talk about how awful the guy who's operating in a once in a century pandemic and how his economy is doing, especially when you compare it to other countries. Now you look at other countries, America has been hit hard just like everywhere else. Well, most other places, there are a few places that have been barely hit at all, but they're typically like itty bitty countries that might have a few thousand people in them. That when you're comparing America to other large European countries or South American countries, America's economic impact has actually been relatively minute. I mean, yeah, we, we've seen a setback, don't get me wrong. But if you're comparing it to other countries, it really hasn't been that bad on the economic scale. And also, Trump didn't cause the virus. Now, there are some economic policies that were put forward that you might could lay blame at his feet for. But another thing that you have to keep in mind too is he left it up primarily to the governors. And now they are the ones that are making a lot of these decisions on the economy. Take a look at this graphic from the University of New Hampshire. This is a map of the United States based on the economic impact of different states. Now, why they chose to use all blue on this, I don't know. It's really hard to see that gradient. But do you see the states that have been hit economically the hardest? Do you notice that? It tends to be the ones that had the harshest shutdown measures. Now, these are the states with the most jobs lost as a percentage. So this is adjusted for population. Therefore, we're comparing apples to apples. You can actually look at states based on their population and what percentage of jobs they had lost. Hawaii lost 16.8%. New York lost 12.8%. Massachusetts lost 11.3%, Michigan lost 10.5%, Vermont lost 10.2%, Alaska 10.1%, New Jersey 9.9%, California 9.8%, Delaware 9.7%, and finally at number 10, Nevada with negative 9.6%. Let's look at the states that had the most restrictive shutdowns. Hawaii at number one. Now, granted, as I said before, it may not really be fair to compare Hawaii just because its economy is basically all tourism money. So that's kind of an outlier, but they did also have very restrictive shutdowns. California at number two. Massachusetts at number three. Maine at number four. New Jersey at number five. Colorado at number six, Arizona at number seven, Oregon at number eight, number nine is Pennsylvania, and finally, rounding out the list at ten, Vermont. Hmm. Seems like there's a lot of similarities between this list. What if we were to highlight all the ones that are on both lists? Huh. 
wow, it seems like a lot of the states with a whole lot of jobs lost also had the most restrictive shutdowns. And by the way, if you were to expand this list to the top 20, those lists are almost identical. So you don't have Michigan or Delaware on the most restrictive shutdowns list, but they are in the top 20. By the way, the most restrictive shutdowns were managed by Wallet Hub. They were the source that I used to get this information. Now, let's look at the opposite. The states with the least jobs lost. First, you've got Idaho only losing 1.8, Mississippi losing 3.0, Utah losing 3.1, Indiana losing 3.9, Arizona losing 4.1, Arkansas losing 4.2, Number seven, our home state of Alabama, losing only 4.4, so good on Alabama on that one. Nebraska losing 4.5, Oklahoma losing 4.7, and Georgia losing only 4.7. Very close, basically a tie with Oklahoma, who only lost a little bit less than the state of Georgia. Now, let's also look at that same list, the same Wallet Hub list, for the least restrictive shutdowns. South Dakota, number one, Idaho, number two, Utah, number three, Oklahoma, number four, Iowa, number five, Wisconsin, number six, Wyoming, number seven, Missouri, number eight, North Dakota is at number nine, and rounding out the list at ten, the state of Arkansas. Looks like there's an awful lot of similarity between these lists as well. Not quite as much. We have one less similarity between the former list. But the point is, the states that tended to have the least restrictive shutdowns also tended to have the least amount of jobs lost. This is not a mistake. This is not a weird coincidence. This is the truth of the matter. When you mandated these shutdowns, a lot of these states that went really hard, really fast on sh shutdowns, and Alabama went way too far, but you know, not as far as some of the other states. When you do that, you are going to see a drop in business. And so the states that had the most restrictive shutdowns tended to also be the ones that saw the most economic impact, and the reverse was also true. So blaming Trump for the economic impact of the virus doesn't make sense because most of those decisions were made on a state-by-state -state basis in the first place. One of the talking points, too, that Kamala Harris brought up that really chaps my hide is where she was talking about, but you're 20-something. They're worried whether or not they're even going to have a job. Uh, I was a 20-something throughout the entirety of the Obama years where Joe Biden was the vice president. And it was not good for the 20-somethings. There were a whole lot of us that were wondering whether or not we could make rent or find a job in that era because of how horrible the economy was for just about the entirety of Obama's tenure in office. So this is youth unemployment, and this is done courtesy of the Wall Street Journal. Let's take a look at the Obama years. That's the Obama presidency. Now, granted you do see a decline after about 2010, 2011. But it's a pretty slow decline, and it's basically just getting back to close to where it was when he started out. And so the Obama years were horrible for youth unemployment. We didn't see a big spike in that until about the time he wound up taking office, a little bit before then, but not much. And unlike the coronavirus, this wasn't some weird happenstance that could be explained away or that Obama couldn't control. There was a lot of resources going around. It, there was very much a possibility for a rebound, but Obama's policies specifically inhibited a lot of this youth employment from going down to where it should have been from the beginning. Headline from CBS's Market Watch. Business eliminated hundreds of thousands of full-time jobs to avoid Obamacare mandate. Up to 250,000 positions may have been eliminated by small businesses seeking to avoid Obamacare's employer mandate, according to estimates in the new working paper distributed by the National Bureau of Economic Research. Altogether, between 28,000 and 50,000 businesses appear to have reduced their numbers of full-time employees from 2014 to 2016 because of the mandate. The share of businesses with fewer than 50 employees grew between 2012 and 2016 to 45% from 37%. 
what you're seeing there is a dramatic increase in the number of businesses that had less than 50 employees. Businesses were intentionally reducing the number of employees so that they could avoid the penalties of the Obamacare mandate. And that is significant because there were people known as 49ers, people that were keeping their businesses under 50 so that they would not have to comply with the Obamacare mandate, which meant that it became so expensive to hire that 50th employee that most companies deemed it easier to figure out a way to get by with 49 as opposed to hiring 50 full-time employees. It stifled business growth and it made jobs harder to find. You see, that's the difference. I can point specifically to things that happened that explain why President Trump and, and the economy that he oversaw had some problems. With Obama, I can point specifically to policies that he made that even bear his name that caused problems and caused a slow economic recovery and caused people to hire less young people. That's the difference in these two things. And number one. And for the number one, the biggest Kamala Harris lie of the evening, and it was hard to narrow it down, but I finally went with packing the court. But your party is actually openly advocating adding seats to the Supreme Court, which has had nine seats for 150 years, if you don't get your way. This is a classic case of if you can't win by the rules, you're going to change the rules. Now, you've refused to answer the question. Joe Biden has refused to answer the question. So I think the American people would really like to know if Judge Amy Coney Barrett is confirmed to the Supreme Court of the United States, are you and Joe Biden, if somehow you win this election, going to pack the Supreme Court to get your way. I'm so glad we went through a little history lesson. Let's do that a little more. In 1864... Well, I'd like you to answer the question. No, Mr. Yes. Vice President, I'm Please. speaking. Please. I'm speaking. Okay. Yeah. In 1864, one of the, I think, political heroes, certainly of the president, I, I assume if you also, Mr. Vice President, is Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln was up for re-election. And it was 27 days before the election. And a seat became open on the United States Supreme Court. Abraham Lincoln's party was in charge, not only of the White House, but the Senate. But Honest Abe said, it's not the right thing to do. The American people deserve to make the decision about who will be the next president in the United States. And then that person can select who will serve for a lifetime on the highest court of our land. So the reason that I picked this one as the number one lie is because it's a lie within a lie. It's like a lie hot dog. You've got one lie wrapped around another lie. It makes a, a lie sandwich. None of it is an answer to packing the court. So at the very least, it's a lie of omission because he's asking her a question. She answers a completely different question that has nothing to do with it and then sits there and acts like she has answered the question when clearly she has not. And it's like, well, we're, we're being very open about this, and we're openly saying that we're not going to answer the question. That's basically her answer. We've been very open about it. We've been very clear about it. And the clear thing that we want to communicate to everybody is we don't want people to know what our response is going to be. <laughs> well, that's not clearness and transparency. You can say a lot of those fancy buzzwords that people tend to resonate with, but that doesn't change the fact that you're not answering the question. This whole thing is just a bald-faced lie. There's no truth to the story she just gave. None whatsoever. The Senate was out of session when that Supreme Court seat became open when Abraham Lincoln was president. They weren't in session. The very first day, the first day that the Senate was in session, a nomination was announced. And he nominated and confirmed Judge Salmon Chase the day that they resumed. Let me restate that. He nominated and they confirmed the same day. So all this talk about how dishonest it is what the Republicans are doing, that President Trump nominates somebody and then they go through the confirmation process and they're saying, it's being rushed through. Uh, yeah, when Abraham Lincoln and his party were in charge of the Senate, he nominated somebody, and then they got confirmed the very same day. So don't talk to me about how Amy Coney Barrett, who now for, what, three weeks, we've been going through the confirmation process, that that's being rushed through, but then say that, 
honest Abe, man, he, he's the monolith. He is the example that we should all be looking to. The second part of that is that the motivation that Kamala Harris attributes to the reason that Abraham Lincoln refrained from nominating somebody is a complete bald-faced lie. There's simply no truth to it. She is inventing history out of thin air. And it would be one thing if we just had no evidence for it. It would still be a lie. She would still just be making crap up and pulling things out of her butt. But the thing is, it's not even that we just don't know why he held off on the nomination. And it's not even just that he held off until uh, announcing who his nominee would be up until the point that the Senate resumed session. We actually know his motivation from history. Now, this is from Lincoln's Cottage, and this particular article was published in 2013, long before the scenario with Amy Coney Barrett was raised. Read this. As ever, Lincoln was the shrewd politician in October of 1864. He saw no profit in alienating any of the factions of his political support by making a selection, talking about the Supreme Court, before the election. There is no evidence that he seriously considered announcing his choice before he was re-elected. Lincoln was not, however, above using the enticement of the office to encourage campaigning on his behalf. The highest prize was the regard of an act and active political support of Salmon P. Chase, the man that eventually became a justice. The former senator, governor, secretary of treasury, and presidential candidate, and a towering figure in the country. In the apt analysis of historian David Donald, after Taney's death in October 1864, Chase took the cue and stumped for Lincoln throughout the Midwest, in marked contrast to his earlier maneuverings in 1864 to replace Lincoln as president. Of course, Chase's unusual behavior did not go unnoticed as rumors of a bargain surfaced. So it's not even that Kamala Harris is just making up history. We know from history the reason that President Lincoln did not go ahead and nominate a Supreme Court justice to go to the bench before the election because he wanted him to campaign for him. He specifically maneuvered it and sort of dropped hints that Chase is going to be the guy that I pick and Chase took the cue and a guy who had not been campaigning for Lincoln at all beforehand suddenly became Lincoln's biggest supporter. That was Lincoln's motivation. It had nothing to do with, well, it would be wrong for me as the duly elected president to nominate somebody so close to the election. That was never a factor in Lincoln's mind in making that decision. And so Kamala Harris is just a bald-faced liar. There's no gentler way to put it. And by the way, she continued to not answer the court packing question over and over again. And so Joe and I are very clear. The American people are voting right now, and it should be their decision about who will serve on this most important body for a lifetime. Thank you, and, and Senator the American Harris. People, Susan, are voting right now. They'd like to know if you and Joe Biden are going to pack the Supreme Court if you don't get your way in this nomination. Let's talk about packing. You once Come again on. gave a non-answer. Joe Biden gave a non-answer. <laughs> trying to answer you the now. American people deserve a straight <laughs> answer. And, and if you haven't figured it out yet, the straight answer is they are going to pack the Supreme Court. Supreme Court. Yeah, Thank let's you. talk about packing the court then. Let's talk about the Please. pack. Yeah, I'm, I'm about to. So the Trump-Pence administration has been, because I sit on the Senate Judiciary Committee, Susan, as you mentioned, and I have witnessed the appointments for lifetime appointments to the federal courts, district courts, courts of appeal. People who are purely ideological, people who have been reviewed by, by legal professional organizations and found to have been not competent are substandard. And do you know that of the 50 people who President Trump appointed to the Court of Appeals for lifetime appointments, not one is black? <laughs> So she continues to give this non-answer. She refuses to answer the question over and over and over again. And then Pence jumps in because she refuses to answer the question. And she says, well, I'm trying to answer. I'm trying to answer. And then he's like, okay, answer. And then she goes, uh, President Trump hates black people. Th that's the only response she had. It's the, the oldest trick in the Democrat playbook. When you've got absolutely nothing to talk about, when you have no leg to stand on, just accuse the other guy of being racist. That's the only arrow left in her quiver. And by the way, that too is an incredibly misleading, 
lie because she's trying to suggest that President Trump would not be comfortable with or would not appoint a black person as a judge. But she parsed her words very carefully to where she wasn't technically saying anything that wasn't true, but it leaves out the larger context in the story. Because, first of all, I mean, like, in what universe does that answer the question of court packing? Obviously it doesn't. But the thing is, Trump has nominated 29, 29 non-white justices to the bench. Eight of them have been black, eight of them have been Hispanic, 12 of them have been Asian, and there was one other. I guess that person's a mixed race. I really don't know. I was just looking at the stats. But when it comes down to that, she said specifically just the ones on the appeals court. There are eight federal judges that were appointed by President Donald Trump that are black. It's not that he feels as though they're incompetent or they can't do it or any of that stuff. This idea that Trump is some kind of wild racist that refuses to appoint black judges, no, he just hasn't happened to appoint one to the Court of Appeals. He's appointed them to other courts. And so it's just absurd, the thing that she's trying to say, to try to suggest that somehow President Trump is racist. She very carefully cherry picks the information that she's trying to show. But it is really sad that lies and personal attacks are basically the only thing that the Biden campaign has left to run on. Well, that and the fact that they also have a person with lady parts and black skin on the ticket. People ask me all the time, Caleb, how do you stay in such great shape? Well, let me tell you, it's not easy. The Secret is a steady diet consisting mostly of likes and subscriptions, especially the ones where the person hits the notification bell. That's what actually gives me my superhuman strength. Likes, as it turns out, are very high in protein and iron. Sadly, doesn't do anything for your hair.